Thank you, ladies, for that musical offering. And may it be the goal of our life to live and bless the Lord with all of our heart, mind, and strength. Thank you, Brother Jose and parents and church school teachers for nurturing the musical gifts of your children. And may they find joy in using them to praise the Lord. For indeed, this is where the strength and the hope and the courage of this uh, generation will be as the world wobbles off of its axis. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the privilege of being in your house today. And we're asking that you would bless us as only you could by the Spirit's teaching ministry. And I'm asking, Lord, that you would establish the work of our hands. This was Moses' prayer. It is our prayer as well. So now, Lord, we put our lives in your hands, and we look to you to be our provider in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm entitled my message this morning, Lions and Tigers and Bears, Oh My. I'm starting the beginning of three series of sermons on saving our children. And if you haven't noticed as of late, it appears that one crisis after another is following our kids around. Uh, I have here this morning in my hands many things I won't have time to go into, but uh, one headline just from a paper uh, presented May 20 at 7 a.m., so that's pretty fresh. We're ignoring a major culprit behind the teen mental health crisis. Now, if you haven't been listening to the news, you're not going to be hearing about the mental health crisis that our young people are facing. But I'm here to tell you today, if you want your children to be strong and you want the youth of your church to be vibrant and able to cope with the unraveling of modern civility, and by the way, the war in Ukraine is an absolute slap in the face to the idea of modernity, one civilized nation just attacking another. If you want your children to be strong and you want your church to be strong in the upcoming generations, it'll be super important that you build on the rock because building on anything else is building on sand. Is that true? And I want you to understand this morning that Coming out of the COVID experience, there is a lot of stress fracture in our society. And if there's one thing leaders cannot do and parents must not do is behave in a way that makes somebody more afraid. Now, how many of you know where this line, lions and tigers and bears, oh my, comes from? Could I just see your hands? Okay, most of you know where this comes from because this film from which this line is taken, is the most watched film in uh, cinematic history. It was produced in 1939. I'm not recommending anybody to go watch it. I'm here to tell you that when it first uh, debuted, it was a moderate success, never a big moneymaker. But about 10 years before I was born, they started showing it once a year. Now, you have to remember that media outlets in, back in the 1960s, late 60s, were few and far between. You had three major television providers and, of course, uh, an AM spectrum on the radio. And you had what they offered, which looks like such a small, thin sliver of the media pie that it's almost unrecognizable today. But I can remember the first time that I watched this film, which I would now not encourage people to watch and have really kind of wrestled with myself relative to even using it as an example though it looks amazingly benign compared to where the, uh, the dialogue about wizardry and witchcraft has gone. But this comes from a line in a movie called The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. Now, we know a wizard is a male witch. The thing about this uh, film was that most everybody in this film was a fake and found out that what they had inside of them was maybe more to be developed than getting it from somewhere else. And we know that the, the major character was a very young, uh, what would become famous movie star, Judy Garland, who would play Dorothy, who was living in her Kansas home and decided she was going to leave with her dog. She came back in time for a tornado uh, to break part of the frame out of the window of her house, put her into some kind of a uh, coma, and a story develops out of that in which she meets some of her new friends, which look an awful lot like her family members and friends from real life. In the midst of landing in another place, because her home was uprooted and carried to uh, another, another location, she 
she dis- dis- discovers that she's got to follow the yellow brick road to get home. She has a few companions. One is Scarecrow, who doesn't have a brain. And one is the Tin Man, who doesn't have a heart. And before it's all said and done, there'll be the Cowardly Lion. But there is a real heroine in the story, and that's the little dog. And of course, Dorothy comes out on top of that as well. And in one point in the movie, she locks arms with the Tin Man, and she locks arms with the Scarecrow, and they start down the yellow brick road into the forest. And as they're going into the forest, they're recounting what there is to be afraid of. Now, I want to suggest to you this morning, friends, that recounting what there is to be afraid of is an exceptionally poor life skill. And for those of you that are prone to worrying, it is a denial of the profession of faith that you have a heavenly father looking out for you. But The Wizard of Oz is not a religious movie. It does make a few interesting, legitimate points. And the one that I want to establish this morning is that as she locks arm with the scarecrow and with the tin man, and they start walking, they ask themselves, what is there to be afraid of? And they come up with a little ditty, lions and tigers and bears. And they walk faster and they take bigger steps, lions and tigers and bears. And they get not far into the jungle before they have their wildest dreams or nightmares fulfilled as a lion roars and comes lunging out of the deep darkness of the jungle. Well, it turns out that this lion is an intimidating factor. And the tin man falls down and the scarecrow falls down and Judy Garland, who's Dorothy, hides behind a tree. And the lion is standing there on one leg saying, come on, put your dukes up. I'll fight you on one leg. I'll fight you with one hand tied behind my back. And then he goes over to the scarecrow and intimidates him. And Dorothy's hiding behind a tree. And the little dog comes out and growls at the lion. Well, the lion doesn't like that. Someone dares to stand up to him. And he starts chasing the little dog. You know, there's something about love that motivates people. And Dorothy, hiding behind her tree, isn't going to let the lion get her dog. She comes out from behind the tree, confronts the lion, slaps him on the hand, and he immediately begins bawling. She says, you're nothing but a coward. And to his credit, he says, I know. And he cries and he cries, and she says, you're making much ado over nothing. Pretty soon there's three of them on this journey, off to see the wonderful wizard, of Oz. Of course, he is a fake too. But on the way, they discover that there's something inside of them that could be developed into the one they want to be. Now, I'm not here today to make something of this. I would suggest that uh, it was the beginning, actually, of making witches and wizards a part of the entertainment fair of America. And from that standpoint, I consider it highly, highly problematic. But as a 10-year-old boy, in the late or the early 70s, watching the once-a-year rendition of this most-watched film in all of film history. Lasting impressions were made, and some that I think might be worthy of at least casting a launching pad for the things we might need to be afraid of. This morning, I'm going to do something I've hardly ever done. I'm going to talk with you a little bit about my doctoral program that I'm in. Most of you don't even know I'm in one. And I've been in one for a long time and almost gotten asked to step out of it. And uh, the reason for that is that I've made my pastoral ministry the first priority of my life here, aside from my family and health, etc. But this fall, I'm going to be implementing my project. I'm not ready yet, but this morning I want to read you a few titles that should startle you about the state of Christianity in America especially as it relates to your teenagers and those that will soon be. I'm going to start with a litany of books. See if you can't develop a theme in them. This one, written by Laura M. Hartman, is entitled The Christian Consumer, Living Faithfully in a Fragile World. This one's by Pete Ward, Selling Worship, How What We Sing Has Changed the Church. Man, I've got a whole weekend planned on that because I think it's absolutely right. How what we sing has changed the church. How about this one? Pop Cultured by Steve Turner, thinking Christianly about style, media, and entertainment. How about this one? 
Shopping for Faith, American Religion in the New Millennium by Richard Camino and Don Latin. Or this one by Jeremy Corrette and Richard King, Selling Spirituality. And here's one, Christotainment, Selling Jesus Through Popular Culture. Are you getting the drift? And by Vincent J. Miller, Consuming Religion, Christian Faith and Practice in a Consumer Culture. You see, friends, our children have grown up in the most monetized youth culture that's ever existed with more money to spend and more entertainment opportunities than any generation in the last several centuries. What's more so is that the parents have probably grown up in the very same generation and the grandparents aren't too terribly far behind because for the last 50, 60, 70, some might say later, when all of the machinery of the post-Second World War production juggernaut was turned into consumerism and all the money of our human efficiencies in America and the lack of World War II devastating this country came to bear on society, we became the king of consumers. And your children have probably learned at times from watching you or somebody else that if you don't like what happens somewhere, you can walk, you can take your wallet, you can take your shoe leather, and you can be somewhere else. And we have preachers that have been schooled in this whole thing. We call it the church growth movement. And they decided that what unchurched Harry and Mary or Saddleback Sam and Saddleback Sally wants is what they should get at church. The truth of the matter is, however, this is not a church business. This is a church family. And families don't work on the business model. It's not a democracy where everybody gets to vote. It's a divine guided mom and pops family enterprise and you're not consumers in this church or wherever you regularly go to church. You are patrons. You are part of a covenant community. You have obligations, and you don't just work from whim and wish. This is the challenge your children are facing because they've learned that they can create their own little eclectic view of faith in the church. I'm holding another book here called Almost Christian, Why Our Teenagers and why our teenagers and their life is tell, what it's telling about the American church. Not a very favorable uh, reference. I'll reference to it a little bit more in a little bit. Here's one already compromised. Christian colleges took a test of the state of their faith, and the final exam is in. Very interesting one. And here's one, Pendulum. Startling insights and perspectives for anyone who wants to be successful now in the future, how past generations shape our present and predict our future. You see, God has found a church to be a light and a sanctuary as the world like a top, spun and placed on its axis in this wobbling moment, has a place to go. I came into church uh, a few Sundays back, and I pushed on my radio, and I toggled back and forth between talk radio and national public radio. And if, if one has got commercials or something else like that, some, something I'm interested, I just go back and forth. I had my radio on the, the talk radio channel when I heard Glenn Beck, who comes on Sunday morning, use a phrase that I think every parent should have emblazoned on their frontal lobe. It was a phrase that should have been coined in a church not in a political pundit's uh, studio. And the phrase was this. He was talking about raising the hero generation. Now, I want you to think about this. If the political pundits recognize that saving America, which is their cause, is going to require some kind of special strength of nerve and spine, perhaps we as Seventh-day Adventist Christians recognizing the prophetic direction the, the world is channeling towards, we should be as intentional in saying we need the spiritual heroes of faith coming out of our midst with a true message that can take away anxiety and nervousness and nerve our young men and women to be Daniels, to be Esthers in this time. When we stop and think about what society is doing, it is urbanizing, it is corporatizing. It used to be that doctors ran their own businesses. Now they're all owned and work for a company, a big health conglomerate. It used to be that people had to make their way on their own with some determination and grit. And now it appears that we're far more dependent on somebody else with the superstructures above us to deliver to us what we need. And the end result is that we are producing young men and young women 
who do not have the confidence to face a rather dark and dour future. And then you throw into it things like extreme, extreme aggression in certain parts of our world, creating extreme inflation and all kinds of other challenges in the polarization of our society. And pretty soon, you've got a world that doesn't look like it has too bright of a future. And you say, Pastor, could we be a bit more positive? Yes, we can. Jesus is coming. Yes, we can. We belong to heaven. This was never supposed to be the great American dream for us. It was supposed to be the American opportunity. And I want everybody to think about this. Paying your tithe is not the sum total of what it means to be a spiritual hero. Showing up for church and Sabbath school doesn't constitute the consummation of what it means to be God's remnant in the final days. You see, there is a high calling on this church which is going to require a revival and a reformation to make us all bonded to Christ and to each other to take as a David, a David enterprise a Goliath gargantuan task. And this morning, I'm going to reveal to you with data and inspiration what the future tells and what the past has told about how to create strength in the hearts and lives of those who have to face a future that doesn't look quite as stable as the one most of us grew up in. So let's go ahead and go about it. Let's start with the things you don't need to save your children from, okay? The first thing I want to say to all parents and all that will become parents is you can never effectively lead anything, including your own home, your own marriage, or your own children, if you work out of fear. Love is the modus operandi for God's people, and as soon as fear takes over, you're going to make mistakes, knee-jerk reactions, or you're going to work inside complacency and apathy and nominalism. That's going to be your, your new way of managing all of these anxieties. Nobody needs to be afraid. Could somebody say amen? Listen, the journey in front of us has a lot to be afraid of unless you've got God walking by your side. But nobody's going to successfully raise a generation who works out of fear because fearful people will constantly be looking to manage the future instead of letting the Lord manage the circumstances that grow the people in their homes. And by the way, you don't need to be afraid of fathers. There's been a war on against dads. I've got an article here. They're not hard to find. This one is 36 shocking statistics about fatherless homes. The last thing you need to be afraid of, wives, is the husbands, even if occasionally they're not doing it quite right. A dad in somebody's life is a ticket to success, even in spite of all of his mistakes. The other thing you don't need to be afraid of is the church. You're not going to over-religionize your kids. You don't need to be afraid of legalism. What you need to be afraid of is nominalism and the absolute apathy that floods into the hearts of young people in this generation as they can have everything they want and live out their dreams, even if their dreams are not God's will or God's plan or really their dream. You don't have to be afraid of saving your children from the church, especially you wouldn't want to be afraid of saving them from conversion. I want to tell you, when this church or some other church puts on evangelistic series, the last place you don't want to be is anywhere except a church. You see, during those very old-fashioned meetings through the foolishness of preaching, which is how faith comes if you accept the inspired word, young people's lives are touched. You don't have to be afraid of placing your children in places where at times they will have a measure of anxiety that comes from growing. You don't have to be afraid of yourself if you're parenting. It doesn't matter what happened in your past. It doesn't matter how many mistakes you think others might have made in the raising of you. You have a living God. You have inspired words in the scriptures and inspired writings through the instrumentality of the prophetic work of Ellen White. Saving your children from these things is a mistake. But there are some things you should try to save your children from. The lions and the tigers and the bears. Oh my. You need to save your children from the affective or the emotional support system that is this world's substitute for love and truth. You need to save your children from esteemism, the idea that all they ever do is good and that the center of their world is them. You need to save them from laziness and call them to a life of service. This is the very first page in the book, Education. The very first goal of the book, Education, is to prepare our children for a life of service. 
When you're too busy to teach them to work, which is a big job. I know, I have four kids. My youngest is 22 years old. Just finished her junior year at Andrews University. Teaching somebody to work is a big job, but it's the parent's job. And it's hard for the schools to do it. So if you leave it for Great Lakes Adventist Academy or some other place, you're actually wounding the school as well as wounding your children. You need to save your children from self-doubt and lack of confidence. How do you do that? You give them confidence in taking on little challenges that are age-appropriate for them. Their confidence grows as they manage reasonable parent-defined tasks. But you cannot allow them to fall into the arms of this isolationistic society where they're better friends with their tablet than they are with their classmate or their teacher or some church member. Pastor Bryce Bowman shared with me the other day a quote from a book. He said, this is the first generation that when we're in public, we want to be alone, and when we're alone, we want to be in public. We can only do that through our devices. We need to save our children from isolationism and teach them the work that goes with being friendly. The Bible says, he who would have friends must be friendly. We must teach them to hold out their hand and look somebody in the eye. We must teach them to greet the strangers, at least those that aren't meant to stay strangers. We must teach them that God has obligated them and enabled them with abilities to fulfill a very defined role. This next one is super important to me. You don't need to save your children from their church school teacher. Not usually. I'm not saying that every church school teacher, the ones we have, are excellent, but not everyone has always been true and honest as the pure driven snow. But by and large, the church school teacher becomes the other adult who really gets to look inside your family's life. And sometimes they have observations that have been kind of a flat spot or a blind spot for you. You do not need to save your children from that partner. They need to be prayed over and supported. You do need to save your children from your own parental anxiety and worry, which means you have to keep growing. You do want to save them from your own fears, and you would like to save them from ignorance. But I'm afraid there is an ignorance that has overtaken us. We call ourselves the people of the book, but I'm quite convinced that all of our opportunities and our wonderful education has catapulted us into a plethora of opportunities that have actually sidelined the centrality of God's Word. I'd like to encourage you that you want to save yourself, parents, from the idea that maintaining the relationship is the tantamount goal. I'll illustrate this just very briefly with a famous story in the Bible about a lost son told in the book of Luke. You remember there was a boy who was lost and he was at home? And the father tried very hard to break into the boy's life. He was the same father to the oldest son as he was to the youngest son. Of course, minor incremental dynamics of differentness, but by and large the same. There came a point in time when he had to say to the youngest son, son, if you think I'm the problem and you think the way I'm ordering this home is the problem, of course, you do have an option. And that is to emancipate yourself. And he said, great idea, Dad. I've been thinking about it. He took a third of the wealth because the oldest got two-thirds. That's part of being the birthright child. And he spent it very rapidly. In those days, there was no tracking device on a cell phone to, to put in the boy's luggage. And there was no way to text out and just say, are you okay? Every night, the father went to bed wondering about what the life of the son was. But the father understood that letting the child go was a step in the child's growth. And while he squandered everything in raunt and debaucherous living, he did come to himself in that pig pen and he went home saying, Dad, you're not my problem. I'm my problem. And while we look to maintain the relationship as long as we can, it is not the parent's goal to steward the home through the dictates and wishes of the child, but is to recognize that parenting is a stewardship of the father and the children are gods and they're given as a sacred trust and you have a responsibility, we call that a fiduciary responsibility to God himself. This is where society has gone off the rails. I can remember reading a letter, two letters that Ellen White wrote to her son, Edson. Two very different letters. You can read the one in the six-volume series of books, 
that is the consummate biography on Ellen White that was written by Arthur, the grandson. And Arthur records a letter that Ellen White wrote to Edson. Edson was living irresponsibly, but because his mother was a prophet, it appeared that he could be heir apparent to managing the Pacific Press in Oakland, California. But the way he managed it was disorderly, and it wasn't God-led. And she writes a letter to this very much adult young man. And in effect, what she says is, if you think that I'm going to use my name to extract you from these troubles you made, you're going to have to think again. Now, later in his life, Edson is the one who builds the Morning Star and floats it down the river from Allegan into Lake Michigan and takes it for the service, service of reaching out to the African-American community. And she writes a beautiful letter. Writing these letters is such an insight. I'm afraid text messaging is going to disappear into the digital netherland, and we won't have these things. But she writes such a beautiful letter to Edson after he's a converted young man. And she says, Edson, you need a counselor who cannot err. Because you don't know if this is the Lord turning you aside or if it's just a challenge, a trial, and a stepping stone. And it's beautiful to watch this woman's relationship to her second of her two children. I, sh I shouldn't say second. Two of her children died. So the two that remained, Willie and Edson. Edson is the younger. And it's beautiful to watch this woman in her adulthood deal with an adult child whose life is not being lived under the principal guidance of the Holy Spirit and to watch him grow. Her parenting wasn't done. Save your children from the idea that when they're 18, voila, all of a sudden they took on full-fledged adulthood. You know, they can be drafted into the army when they're 18, but they still can't buy cigarettes. There's something to think about. And I want us to realize here today that adolescence has been pushed farther and farther out by a world that is dead set on turning your child into an addict slash consumer so they can forever be on the hook to use their money to keep some digital mogul living life in the fast lane. For indeed here, I want to assure you this morning, God has a plan, and that plan is to turn your children into beacons of light and pillars of strength in a generation and for their generation. We need to save them from the idea that data is where the real truth is at. Next week, I'm going to talk about that. I've entitled my message, The Monkeys in the Zoo, No Experimenting Allowed. We need to teach them that they are not customers, and we need to remind them that it's not about their rights, but it's about their obligations. And we need to save them sometimes from their dreams, especially when their dreams are not oriented in God's will. We need to save them from their peers at times and save their peers with them. And sometimes we need to save them from indulgent generations, I'm thinking grandparents right now, who somehow think that they've come to a new epiphany of how to raise children. It's so unlike how you were raised, you're not sure you're talking to the same people. We need to go get over ourselves and get on with parenting in the vein of that which for six millennia people have by and large operated as a corporately held value system for our children. Now, in this book, Almost Christian, the largest longitudinal study of adolescence done in America, I'm going to, I don't have the time to go through very much. There are five main points from this study. She says this book is for people like us, people who care about the teenagers we love, people who are in youth ministry, who by virtue of the fact that we are Christians promise with each other and with every baptism so it's for every member to help raise each other's children. She highlights five dynamics that are destroying our people. The book is entitled Almost Christian, What the Faith of Our Teenagers is Telling the American Church. She says the National Study of Youth and Religion conducted in 2002 to 2005 is the most ambitious study of American teenagers and religion to date involving extensive interviews with more than 3,300 American teenagers between the ages of 13 and 17, followed up by interviews with some of their parents, face-to-face -face follow-up with 267 of these teenagers. First thing they found, most American teenagers have a positive view of religion, but otherwise they don't give it much thought. I want you to think about this for a minute. Listen to these reflections. Teenagers tend to view God as either a butler or a therapist, someone who meets their needs when summoned. 
As one youth worker stated, a cosmic lifeguard who listens non-judgmentally and helps youth feel good about themselves, kind of like my guidance calendar counselor. The bad news is that the region, reason that teenagers are not hostile towards religion is they do not care about it very much. Now, I hope there's many teenagers here today in a completely different posture. Religion is not a big deal to them. People fight over the things that matter to them, but religion barely causes a ripple in the lives of most adolescents. Teenagers gra gladly grant people the right to explore their own religions and to construct their own eclectic spiritualities, but they are not doing it for themselves. So while religion is seldom a source of conflict for teenagers, it is seldom a source of identity, as we will see in chapter 2. Now take your Bibles and open up to the book of Proverbs, if you would. The book of Proverbs. I want to look at chapter 28. Proverbs chapter 28. And I'm going to quote from a number of versions of this. Proverbs chapter 28. And I want us to take a moment and think about what this means. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 4. It says, those who forsake the law praise the wicked, but those who keep the law strive with them. Now, if there's a real battle going on for the heart and souls of your children and you're sitting on the sidelines, it might be that you are passively saying with a nominal faith and a nominal interest, they can choose their own way. It doesn't really matter to me that much how it turns out. Of course, the last thing most uh, insecure parents want today is for the child to grow up and say anything bad about the parents. As a matter of fact, we have to be affirmed as parents in such ways that probably affirmation ought not ever to come, at least not in a cycle that reinforces what the, parent, what the child would like. It's fine for another parent to say to you, I really think you're doing a nice job raising your kids, and it's great for a grandparent or someone in that generation to inform it. And it's nice when your kids can tell you what a great parent you are, and there should be some of that. But the real direction for whether or not you're doing a good job or not is not the heart, it is, it is not the messaging that comes back to you through the one you're discipling. For at times, that cannot be anything but a bit of frustration. Let's listen to what some other versions of the Bible say here. I especially like the New Living Translation. It says, to reject the law is to praise the wicked. To obey the law is to fight them. Now, fight's kind of a strong word. And I'm not here to suggest this morning we have a fighting spirit about anything. But I am here to tell you today that the devil has placed a crosshair on the mind of every adolescent, and what he is hoping is that the parents will stand aside while he takes them out from their spiritual inheritance. God knows that at the very end of time, the one thing he wants to do is turn the hearts of the children to the fathers and the fathers to the children. That's God's counteracting of what the devil's trying to do, which is turn the hearts of the children away from the fathers. So maybe there's going to have to be a bit more engagement. The Christian Standard Bible says this, those who reject the law praise the wicked, but those who keep the law pit themselves against them. Let's go to the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Those who reject the law praise the wicked, but those who keep the law battle against them. How about the Septuagint, the Brenton version? They that forsake the law praise ungodliness, but they that love the law fortify themselves with a wall. And the last version I'll quote is the Good News Translation. If you have no regard for the law, then you're on the side of the wicked. I like this. But if you obey it, then you are against them. Now, I'm going to end this sermon, not right at this moment, but when I end it, I'm going to end it with a little, we're going to take a step back into the Reformation, and I'm going to show you how godly people with various spectrums of profession know how to stand up and put their face into the wind for what is right. The book of Hosea tells us that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. If we are not working for a converted child if we are not working in our homes as youth pastors, if we are not working as the first teachers, we are working outside the construct that the spirit of prophecy gives us and the Bible affirms. God has called the parents to be the first pastors, the first teachers, and the church is to be first at the home and occasionally inside a larger building with the family of faith. But God is calling us today to recognize that there is right and wrong in this world, and he's contending through his people for the preservation of a 
honorable society. The society itself is turned upside down. I mentioned earlier the wonderful Wizard of Oz. The other day, I was flipping through the channels on my television, something I rarely have time to do, and I came across one of these channels that puts out all the old programs, the ones that I grew up with as a kid. I did not grow up in a Christian home. I watched tons of television. And, you know, the funny thing is, when I to told my wife about the sermon, I could sing the song about the wonderful Wizard of Oz. Do you realize I haven't seen that film in probably 40 years, but the words of the song and the tune came out just like that? I'm here to tell you, your kids are sponges. The devil knows it. So what better thing than to saturate them through the Trojan horse of a computer media device in their pocket. You see, by beholding, we are changed. And what your kids are beholding, they are becoming. Even Thomas Jefferson knew this. Someone sent me uh, a newsletter that had a variety of quotes. It is doing that is becoming. And the reality is, is that if we are not acquainting ourselves with the law of God... And if we are not hiding God's word in our heart, our kids are being squeezed as Play-Doh into the mold of this world. And if we don't know what's wrong with the principled underpinnings of a variety of this entertainment generation we live in, it breaks my heart whenever I have to deal with somebody that's maybe within 10 or 15 years of age of me and they're addicted to gaming. Somebody else addicted to far worse things but I'm not here to legitimate one thing on the basis of something else being much worse. Are you willing and are you able on behalf of your child like Dorothy did when the lion wanted to chase her little dog, are you willing to stand up for anything? Do you have enough information about what right and wrong is in the development of a child or have you simply kind of just casually, nominally entered into this journey? Are our schools upholding the hands of the parent, or are they needing to be the instrumentality of re-educating the parents? God forbid, but yes, that's where a number of them are. Do we have the principles and the precepts of inspired direction for raising children at the center of our lives? Or are we simply going with the data and moving with the culture, and the last thing we want is for somebody to accuse us of being kind of a narrow-minded parent? Yes, those who abandon the law praise the wicked, but those who keep the law strive with them. I want to tell you, our society has not so subtly over the last 30 years made contesting about anything look like you're a problematic person. Recently, Southern College had taken a decision that they would enact a assigned gender at birth policy for what bathrooms the children would use, the kids would use, and how they would dress. For most of us listening to this, that makes sense. But two weeks ago, I got a text on my phone, and it was an attempt to garner 2,500 signatures, which I have no doubt they got. And those 2,500 signatures were designed to get the larger attention of the media. Now, at the top of the text, there was a big billboard. And for those of you that follow the news at all, you'll recognize what it was related to. And on the vertical edge, it said, say... And on the horizontal edge, in great big letters, gay. And then written into the text was this verbiage to show you how subtle and slick this is. Written into the verbiage was this narrative, which I almost know by heart, even though I didn't try to memorize it. 80% of transgender young people have thought about suicide. This is sober. And I have compassion, as I hope all Christians would. It went on to say that of the 80% that have contemplated suicide, 40% have attempted. That's sad too. I started out this message talking about the mental state of our young people. I've referenced in this sermon to building on the rock, not sand. Then it went on to say, this is the subtleness, that for most young transgenders, Identity in their school, school community is a key component of their self-well-being. Now, I don't doubt that that's true. And I don't doubt that 80% of transgender young people have contemplated suicide, and I don't doubt that 40% have attempted. 
But what I want to show you is the very slick and subtle attempt to take an institution that could give a mental and emotional and spiritual strength to these young people by directing them away from confusion into truth and make them look like they are institutional bigots, careless and hard-hearted. Now, in 30 years of ministry, I can assure you that the spectrum of people I have dealt with is wide and varied. And for any Christian who has no compassion for those that have been chewed up and spit out by the false philosophies of this life, woe be unto you as a false prophet and a false witness in the name of Jesus. But woe be unto all the rest of us as well if we fail to take a stand for what is right because of the cyberbullying and the extreme commitment on the other side of unrighteousness to making sure that light is not darkness and darkness is not light. We are living in a very dangerous age where it has actually been taught on the campuses of our schools that you cannot love the sinner and hate the sin. No greater premise is at the root of the heart of God and the gospel initiative born in heaven and carried and picked up by the church than that very potent truth that you can love the sinner while you hate the sin. We are locked in a battle that is across the spectrum politically, but its origin of, its locus of understanding ought to be in the church. And while Jesus could minister to the sexually broken and say in John chapter 8, neither do I condemn you, go and what? Sin no more. So the church must walk in his footsteps with the same compassion, but the same commitment to knowing that the law that, that protects us from these cesspools of expression, these licentious, license-oriented lifestyles that cause us self-shame and reproach must be taught if we're going to have people that are strong of mind and spirit. You see, we're living in an age where to stand up and fight for anything, especially where everybody should be able to self-select their value system, has been turned into the ultimate social anathema. And that word means the thing you hate the most. So we don't want anybody standing up and saying, it's not okay to cut party pots off and give yourself hormones and become somebody else. There is a God who knit you together in your mother's womb. And while you may have anxiety about it and traumatizing dynamics in your, in your developmental years, we will love you and not try to make you what we want you to be, but we will help you to know who God made you to be. While there is a place for Christian witness and worship, there is also a place to declare identity and protection to cultural, corporate values and to family dynamics. And when a parent can't do that, or a school can't do that, or a church can't do that, we might as well throw up our hands and not pray the prayer of David that they would be faithful until they declare God's faithfulness to the next generation. I'm here to tell you today that if there's anything worth fighting for, it's not a little dog that stands up to a cowardly lion. It's our very own children. That's why a mother could endure Jesus saying to her, it's not right to take the bread off the table and feed it to the little dogs. Now, she saw through what Jesus was doing. The apostles were bigots, and they didn't want to deal with a Canaanite, dark-minded woman. But she wasn't as dark-minded as they thought. And when she realized in Jesus' hope to get out of this pit, she didn't have all the cultural benefits of being a Jew. And there were many. And we have many cultural benefits of being Seventh-day Adventists. But it doesn't mean there's not need for a work of reform in our own hearts, in our own homes, in our own schools, and in our own churches. And while God has not commissioned any one of us to go out and be a rebel or a revolutionary, he has called all of us to have enough love and dignity, enough carefulness for what it means to manage authority. So when we're dealing with issues and people and circumstances, but we are called to be people who with dignity and kindness and respect can have the kind of dialogue that helps wrongs get righted. But you better know what to expect. You better know that all kinds of evil will be heaped upon you as you do this. 
And for anybody that's parented an adolescent child, there are certainly a few rough moments. You can't go from being identified through your parents to being identified independently without a few moments. Dobson had a good saying. He said, don't take all the credit if they turn out good and don't take all the blame if they turn out bad. We're living in a society that's actively trying to take our kids from us. Sometimes the church is cooperating in a consumer mindset. It's not good. It will mean eternal loss. And it's going to take a lot of kindness and courage and dignity and proper self-control to deal with it. But I just want to remind you, those who abandon the law praise the wicked, but those who keep the law strive with them. Do we think the Seventh-day Adventist church, do we think the Seventh-day Adventist schools, do we think the Seventh-day Adventist homes are the first ones in the history of the world that don't need a work of reformation? They never need to hear a prophetic voice? That nobody ever needs to say, hey, you're, you're deviating. I like to make it a metaphor like this. You know, if I got a brand new car and I took it out on the interstate, I don't think I want to drive so far off the road that I'm rubbing the beautiful paint up against the guardrail. I don't want to run it so far off the road that the sparks are flying out the right side, but I'm saying I'm doing it my own way. I needed driver's education. I needed premarital counseling. And I needed parental inspiration to save me from all the data-driven counsel, which I'm going to talk about next week, that led to a new way, a new epiphany for how to raise children. Look where we're at. We're in trouble. For all those faithful parents that are seeking to be faithful, to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly, keep your courage. Don't give up. You're not raising the kids for the accolades they'll give you now. You're raising them for the legitimate affirmation when they rise up to that Proverbs 31 woman and bless you. I only have time to do one more thing. I'm going to do it very quickly. The second of her five points is this. Most U.S. teenagers mirror the parents' religious faith. This is kind of heavy. This is kind of heavy. The 13 to 17-year-olds in the study were highly conventional, content to adopt their parents' religious inclinations. Did you hear that word? They were willing to adopt their parents' inclinations. It would have been better if it would have said religious convictions. By and large, Smith and Denton, who did the original research, said that parents get what they are religiously. This theme is taken up in detail in a later chapter. Parents matter most when it comes to the religious formation of their children. And while grandparents and other relative mentors and youth ministers also are influential, parents are by far and away the most important predictors of teenagers' religious lives. Now, I'm going to close the book up. I'm going to give you a quiz. Which religious persuasion in America do you think is succeeding best with their kids? Get a, get a name. I'm going to tell you that some people don't recognize it as a Christian faith, so I'm giving you a clue. I'm going to tell you that Mitt Romney is the senator from their state, so I'm getting it a little bit easier. And I'm here to tell you this morning that the Mormon children in this study come out with a whole lot less anxiety and a whole lot more confidence, a whole lot more understanding of what their faith adherency means than any other faith group. The Protestants in general are very poor. Mainline is worse than conservative. And the Catholics are not too far separated from the Protestants. I'm going to end today with a call to reformation. I'm going to take you back to 1521, 500 years ago, and I'm going to just give you the little buildup that preceded Martin Luther's message at Worms. Luther didn't feel well, and the elector had given him safe passage because the emperor had. Aleander, the papal legate or ambassador, did not want Luther coming to Worms. Frederick the elector, not to be confused of Saxony with Gregory the elector of Saxony, Frederick was concerned. Luther did not come to the Diet, which is another word for a large council, which went on for weeks, sometimes months. And Aleander, the legate, from, he was the nuncio or the spokesperson for Rome, decided he was not only going to 
make sure Luther never showed up, but he was going to get condemnation. So he makes this powerful speech. Luther is not there. It appears that Luther has no defenders. This is what he said. What are these Lutherans? A crew of insolent pedagogues, corrupt priests, dissolute monks, ignorant lawyers, degraded nobles, with the common people with whom they've misled and perverted. How far superior in, to them are the Catholic party in numbers and ability and power? A unanimous decree from this illustrious assembly will enlighten the simple, warn the imprudent, and decide the, wa uh, decide the waivers and give strength to the weak. With such weapons, the advocates of truth in every age have been attacked. So what am I getting at here? That if you bother to contend with any issue, you might get attacked too. The same arguments are still urged against those who dare to present in opposition to established errors the plain and direct teaching of God's word. Who are these preachers of new doctrines, exclaim those who desire a popular religion? Luther wasn't there. Many of the, of the princes at the diet were willing to turn him over. But there were a few there who said not so quick. Ellen White writes in Great Controversy, Rome had enjoyed the most favorable opportunity to defend her cause. That's yeah, quite a fight. You get the microphone and then nobody else does. All that she could say in her own vindication had been said, but the apparent victory was the signal of defeat. While most of the members of the Diet would not have hesitated to yield up Luther to the vengeance of Rome, many of them saw and deplored the existing depravity in the church, and they desired a suppression of the abuses by the German people in consequence to the corruption and the greed of the hierarchy. Now, there was a man there, Duke George of Saxony. He was Luther's enemy. It's a very important fact. And there are people who honestly disagree with the principles of the Bible and the precepts of the spirit of prophecy, and some of them even name the name Seventh-day Adventist. And inside our institutions of higher learning, and inside our schools, and more importantly, inside our homes, there's an absolute battle going on for the culture, the actual air our children are breathing religiously, the actual water our children are swimming in. And Duke George of Saxony was an enemy of Luther. But watching the unfairness of what had gone on, he decided to speak. With noble firmness, Duke George of Saxony stood up in that princely assembly and specified with terrible exactness the deceptions and the abominations of popery and their dire results. And in closing, this is what he said. These are some of the abuses that cry out against Rome. All shame has been put aside, and their only object is money, 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 so that the preachers who should teach the truth utter nothing but falsehoods and are not only tolerated but rewarded because the greater their lies, the greater their gain. It's from this foul spring that such tainted waters flow. Debauchery or immorality stretches out the hand to avarice, which is another word for greed, Alas, it is the scandal caused by the clergy that hurls so many poor souls into eternal condemnation. A general reform must be effected. She comments like this, a more able and formidable denunciation of papal abuses could not have been presented by Luther himself. I don't know where you are today. I don't know if you've ever opened the book Adventist Home or Child Guidance. I don't know if you open your Bible regularly, although if I'm around you very much, it's not like I have no idea. I'm not the key deciding factor. There's a God up above. And the Bible says children are a heritage from the Lord. And God is going to hold us accountable for the culture we create for our kids because the air they breathe and the water they swim in it's the parent and the grandparent journey to deal and direct and develop. I'm here to say this today. The Jesus we served went to the cross to save young and old. The Jesus we served turned over tables and turned his cheek. 
The Jesus we serve calls us to be the most humble and respectful people on the planet, but humble enough to stand up for what we know is right until we know it's not right or until someone else knows it's right. And what God is directing for his people is a mature enough depth in him and a mature enough relationship to each other to where nothing is off the table for discussion. As soon as someone tries to tell me that can't be discussed, which I had somebody tell me this week, going away from that meeting, I had to say to myself, why not? We discussed this, and it basically split the church. Our Christian maturity allows us to deal with ideas to see if they're true or false, not feelings about things we might or might not know very much about. This society is built on affect. It's built on emotion. That's why everybody needs a thumb up and a hand together. And I'm not against that. The Bible has proper edification for all of us. And a word of encouragement is like an apple of gold in a pitcher of silver. But what God is calling us to today is leadership for our young people that was that, is without fear, that creates a culture that they can face without fear. And so they can not only save their own souls, but they can be the instrumentality of saving somebody else. Because there's tons of almost Christians out there who don't know the freedom and the joy of a heart with nothing between them and Jesus. And the strength that gives them is amazing. When Martin Ramirez stood up here this morning with tears in his eyes, recollecting what God took him from and where God is taking him now, that, my friends, is the goal of every home, every school, and every Seventh-day Adventist church. God is leading us to put their feet on solid ground, not sand, and show them how they can be a pillar to replace those mighty oaks that are falling that are two or three generations in front of them. I leave you with this quote. I wrote it on the inside cover of my book, Almost Christian. It comes from Christ Object Lessons, page 118. There are some who seem to be always seeking for the heavenly pearl, but they do not make an entire surrender of their wrong habits. They do not die to self that Christ may live in them. I'm going to read that sentence one more time. They do not die to self that Christ may live in them. That's how it works. Therefore, they do not find the precious pearl. They have not overcome unholy ambition and their love for worldly attractions. That's what you should be afraid of is that your kids are going to fall in love with the mistress of this world. They do not take up the cross and follow Christ in the path of self-denial and self-sacrifice. Now you'll see why I have the quote in these last two sentences. Almost Christians, yet not fully Christians. They seem near the kingdom of heaven, but they cannot enter it. Almost, but not wholly saved, means to be not almost, but wholly lost. The old songs that your grandparents sang, like Trust and Obey, those were the gospel. And while the Bible says we should create new songs, there is a verse in there that says, but the joy he bestows is for those who all on the altar lay and who trust and obey. This, friends, is my appeal to every parent, every grandparent, every church member. May the Spirit of God do its work of revival and reformation in our hearts and in our homes. And may we not parent out of fear and may we not be afraid of this society as it's aligned itself against those who would still preach righteousness, morality, and the rock of Jesus Christ. May God strengthen our children as he strengthens their parents, their churches, and their schools. And may we not walk down any road, supposedly the yellow brick or any other one, reinforcing our fears. But may we remember Jesus is about to come He's going to strengthen his people, pour out his spirit. The young men and the young women are going to do a great work if they've prepared their hearts for the receiving of that spirit. And by God's grace, we're going to see an amazing apostolic redo. And we're going to see thousands come in. Kids that have barely learned to read are going to be preaching the gospel because they've hidden the word of God in their hearts. It's no time to be afraid. We all battle fear. But what time I am afraid, I'm going to trust in the Lord. And they that wait upon the Lord renew their strength. It's time for God to send the spirit of justice and judgment to turn back the battle at the gates, Isaiah 28. 
May he start with our homes, may he go to our schools, and may our churches hold up the hands of both teachers and parents. May God bless us as we anticipate the soon return of Jesus and a generation ready to help get the world ready to see him. Amen.